decision on the date of the general election to be made on Monday. Task force with top military brass appointed to build a secure country, a disciplined, virtuous and lawful society. What is the actual debt burden of the country? Revelations about a 700 billion rupee discrepancy. Violent protests against racism in the United States to spread worldwide. A very good evening to you. I'm Chaturang Hapwarachi. Let's take a look at those stories in detail now. Chairman of the National Election Commission, Mahinda Deshapriya, says that the date of the general election will be decided on Monday, the 8th of June. The National Election Commission convened this evening and a booklet containing health guidelines to hold the general election was handed over by the health authorities at the event. We received the report this evening. What's mentioned in this are the guidelines that need to be followed when holding the election. Once this document is studied, we will decide on the date of the election during a meeting between the members of the National Election Commission next Monday and then announce it. We are hoping to make clusters of five to six polling stations and place a doctor, two nurses and an assistant at each cluster to monitor proceedings. A polling station will be inspected at least four times a day before the election and on the day of the election. We do not encourage the general public to take the virus lightly just because a Supreme Court verdict has been given and the elections will be held. There are only three basics pointed out in the health guidelines. Social distancing of one meter, washing your hands and wear the face masks. What is important is a level playing field for all political parties. We also wish to request mayors, deputy mayors, chairmen and vice-chairmen of urban councils, municipal councils and Pradeshya Sabhas who are contesting at the election to take leave from their positions. The election apparatus is now active. The issuance of serial numbers for candidates will also be decided on Monday. Our theme is defeat COVID-19 and ensure democracy for the people. We are in a position to move forward with the preparations for the election because we have been able to curb the spread of the coronavirus. However, we know that any country can face the risk of a second wave of cases. Therefore, it is important to maintain social distancing, respiratory etiquette and to also sanitize and keep our hands clean. It is based on these fundamentals that we have prepared guidelines to suit each situation. Political parties express their views on the upcoming elections once again today. The Sri Lanka Pothujana Peramuna is of the stance that there is no reason to delay the holding of the general election any longer. The coronavirus cannot be eradicated. The legal process will have to be adapted accordingly. The political greed of the opposition supersedes the pandemic. They tried to use the judiciary to create a political issue. The verdict given by the judiciary has laid the opposition bare. The Commission can call for nominations on the 19th of March and have the election on the 25th of April in just five weeks. There is no rational reason to drag this on for 11 or 12 weeks. The advice given to the Elections Commission was to practice social distancing, not to distance time. So we asked the Commission if they want to protect a sliver of what they call independent, they have to act fast and hold this election as soon as possible. We know that this general election is a tug of war for preferential votes. When this happens, the public will automatically be caught up in the midst of it. The public must be in a position to get involved in this without any fear. Our stance is that we must avoid such a situation and hold the election. 
We went to court to avoid the 20th of June and that has been achieved successfully. So we have won. The attorneys representing the election commission said that they will need 9 to 11 weeks from the date that the Director General of the Health Services states that a free and fair election can be held in the country. An election is not the date of voting. We have emerged victorious here. Beyond that, we would like to know why the court did not intervene in the running of the country without a parliament for over three months. We did not go to court as a party because we did not think of those considerations seriously. We have most serious considerations to worry about. We weren't in the mindset of having elections postponed, but we wanted to have the risk of corona mitigated. We were ready from then itself, which is why we didn't go to court. I think the opposition and the two parties that they have broken into have no political revival. They have both fallen into the depth that is beyond measure. In this backdrop, we are confident that we can achieve a massive victory. In pursuit of bringing Arjuna Mahindran back down to Sri Lanka, all the letters exchanged and legal steps we took, we reached out to Interpol as the Sri Lankan government saying that he is a wanted man in connection to a serious financial crime. I haven't said this before, but then some members of our government went and wrote to Interpol saying that there had been no financial crime and that this matter was a political one. Then the Interpol told us that they had been informed in this manner and so cannot get involved in the process. Then we reverted to Interpol with many explanatory documents explaining the Presidential Commission, its role, the Constitution and the Attorney General as well as their rules. When we presented those documents, they were accepted by Interpol. That is why they issued a red notice to make the arrest. President Gotabe Rajapaksa has issued two Gazette notifications declaring the appointment of two presidential task forces in the country. According to the Gazette, the presidential task force to build a secure country and a disciplined, virtuous and lawful society will comprise 13 members. Defence Secretary, retired Major General Kamal Gunaratna has been appointed the chairman of the task force. The other members will include Army Commander Lieutenant General Shavendra Silva, Navy Commander Vice Admiral Pial de Silva, Air Force Commander Air Marshal Sumangala Dias and Acting IGP C.D. Vikramaratna. Customs Director General, retired Major General Vijita Ravipriya Chief of the National Intelligence Service, Major General Jagat Alvis, and Director of the State Intelligence Service, Major General Suresh Shale, are also members of the task force. Director of the Army Intelligence Unit, Major General A.S. Heva Vitarana, Director of Navy Intelligence, Captain S.J. Kumara, Director of Air Force Intelligence, Air Commodore M.D.J. Vasage, D.I.G. of the Police Special Task Force, T.C.A. Danapala, and D.I.G. Varunajai Sundara are also among the members of the body. The Assistant Secretary to the Defence Ministry, DMS Disanayaka, has been appointed as the Secretary of the Task Force. Meanwhile, the President has also appointed the Presidential Task Force for Archaeological Heritage Management in the Eastern Province. Eleven members, including Archaeological Chakravarti, Venerable Ellavala Medananda Thera and Venerable Panamure Tilakavansha Thera, who is the Chief Prelate for the Northern and Eastern Provinces and the Chief Sanganayaka of Taman Kadua Direction, make up this task force. Defence Secretary, retired Major General Kamal Gunaratna has been appointed as the chairman of this task force as well. The body comprises members that include the Director General of Archaeology, Dr. Senarat Disanayaka, Surveyor General ALSC Pereira, Senior Lecturer at the University of Kalania, Professor Raj Kumar Somadeva, and Senior Lecturer of the Medical Faculty at the University of Kalania, Professor Kapila Gunavardhana. Senior DIG of the Western Province, Deshabandhu Tendakon, Provincial Land Commissioner of the Eastern Province, HEMWG Disanayaka, and businessman Dilit Jaivira are also among the members of the body. Senior Assistant Secretary to the President, Jeevanti Senanayaka, has been appointed as the Secretary of this task force.
Still in local news, an acting Commissioner General has been appointed to the Department of Prisons. The appointment has been made following a cabinet paper presented by the subject minister. Accordingly, Prisons Commissioner Tushar Upuldenia has been appointed as the acting Commissioner General to the Department of Prisons. Secretary to the Minister of Justice and Prison Reforms, S. M. Mohammed, confirmed the appointment. It's the eighth day of protests across the United States over the death of George Floyd, an unarmed black man at the hands of the Minneapolis police. There's an update to this saga. Experts hired by George Floyd's family and the Hennepin County Medical Examiner have concluded his death was a homicide. The independent autopsy says Floyd died of exficiation from sustained pressure which cut off blood flow to his brain. But the medical examiner's office said that the cause of death is heart failure. Some stunning footage. Following are the views expressed by the leader of the Samagi Jana Balavegya, Sajit Premadasa, and candidate of the NPP, Nalin Hevage. What is the lesson we should learn from the United States? Those protests and disparities are leading the country towards a social disaster. Various groups in our country also try to fuel extremism. There is no room for extremism or terrorism in our country. Against a backdrop where the United States of America is battered by widespread racial tensions, Sri Lanka should realize it is only through peace, unity and sovereignty that our country can attain prosperity. We are ready to lead the country towards that. As you learn your lessons from the aftermath of COVID-19, open your eyes and witness social destruction. If the peace and unity will not prevail in our country, there is a chance that Sri Lanka will also fall into the same fate. We have to unite. I would also like to ask you to get together to beat Corona and overcome the challenges that lie ahead. The U.S. is burning due to the conduct of its leaders and officials in the backdrop of the murder. We know that past rulers in Sri Lanka had attempted to subdue the country through various agreements. One is the SOFA agreement. If we had signed the agreement, the U.S. troops would have been able to arrive in Sri Lanka. They will be able to travel to any part of the country by carrying weapons. The police or the court will not be able to take action if they steal the country's property, slaughter cows for consumption or even abuse our women. According to the agreement, those matters would have to be dealt with by the U.S. We can assume how U.S. officials will treat Sri Lankans based on how they had conducted themselves there by going to the extent of pinning a person down to his neck and onto the ground. What will happen to Sri Lanka amid such a situation? The rulers can open their eyes now and see what is happening in the U.S. We wish to point out that the rulers are now able to witness the fate that would befall Sri Lanka if the agreement had been signed. <laughs> Permit me to draw your attention to the wild elephant conflict in the country. We first go to Navagattegama. As dusk sets in, wild elephants break into the Kurukatiava village in Navagattegama. Wild elephants which remain deep inside forests during the day have been breaking into villages at night. This is the destruction caused by the wild elephants which encroach these villages. We used to engage in agriculture by spending our money at hand. This incident occurred a few days before we were able to generate some income through our cultivation. We have not been able to make a living through this. All our crops have been destroyed. Officers attached to the wildlife office in Navagattegama arrived in the area to witness the destruction caused by these elephants. However, no solution has been found to this issue as of yet. Area residents revealed that wild elephants had been chased into the forests under a special operation carried out recently. Several houses have been destroyed. There is no point in complaining. The people won't have to suffer if habitats are created for these elephants to allow them to find water and food. Our crops are destroyed no matter how much hardships we undergo to cultivate them. We cannot go onto the streets at night. We are living amidst a big battle. Our cultivations have been destroyed. These elephants have got used to eating our crops, as there is more food here than in the forests. 
The village of Kurukatiav is located in the Putlam district. The problems posed by wild elephants to these villages have been continuously highlighted in our government the reports in 2016, 2017 and 2018. Do you think those who are involved in corruption are being punished on the basis of their political relationship? The JVP thinks so. The party's propaganda secretary, Vijita Herat, made this remark during a media briefing while responding to a query on the failure to extradite former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahendran. In a letter published online, former Central Bank Governor Arjuna Mahendran, who is a chief suspect in the Central Bank bond scam, had rejected the allegations that have been levelled against him. He had also denied providing internal information regarding the issuance of Treasury bonds to his son-in-law during his term as Central Bank Governor. Against a backdrop in which a Presidential Commission report has recommended filing criminal charges against him and a warrant has been issued for his arrest, Arjuna Mahendran has failed to appear before the court. Certain loud-mouthed people in the government are saying that he would be brought to the country like KP by dragging him by his ear. However, Susil Premajanta is saying that he will have to be brought to the country in keeping with extradition laws and by following diplomatic traditions as he is a Singaporean citizen. They did not tell this at this time. During the presidential election period, they didn't promise to apprehend the bond scam culprits including Arjuna Mahendran and enforce the law against them. They have been unable to enforce the law against them yet. They will not do it. What did they do after they caught KP? Did they punish him? Did they enforce the law against him? No. They brought KP and sent him to Kilinochi under state patronage and kept him in comfort. If they are trying to bring Arjuna Mahendran like KP, we doubt whether this is how they would treat him as well. They are idling. They won't punish the thieves. What is happening now is what happened in the past. While an Interpol red alert had been issued for the arrest of Udanga Viratunga, together with open warrants issued by Sri Lankan courts, he had been in hiding. They brought him back to the country amidst the coronavirus pandemic and then released him. This clearly shows that they will protect the thieves on their side while striking deals and protecting the others. News First has always been committed to revealing corruption. One such questionable transaction we shed light on was the process followed when awarding the LPG tender for 2017 and 18. We revealed how a state corporation in Oman, which had met all requirements to be awarded the tender, was removed after citing unjustified reasons after another corporation which had fulfilled lesser requirements was awarded the tender. The manner in which telephone calls had been made by a person who had attended the executive board meeting while discussions regarding the deal had been taking place was revealed subsequently. The ambiguity surrounding the transaction deepens further since the Oman-based corporation had agreed to provide LPG at a discounted price. Kabir Hashim was the subject minister during the time this transaction took place. Many allegations were levelled against Kabir Hashim's private secretary, who was also a relative of the former minister, for allegedly being involved as a middleman in the entire transaction. However, these allegations were suppressed by time. Shouldn't an unbiased and comprehensive investigation be conducted into these unresolved misdealings? Shouldn't those responsible be penalised and prosecuted for these misdealings? We want a clean parliament. We want a clean government. Think before you vote. Staying on the same theme, a revelation was made today on a questionable transaction that took place at Satosa. A salmon tin that was reduced by the president to 100 rupees has been sold at 185 rupees by Nushad Pereira to a private food distribution entity. More than 100,000 tins have been sold in this manner. We are in possession of all these information. Yesterday, Nushad Pereira said that we are tarnishing his image. We challenge him to come before media and make a statement saying that he did not purchase salmon at 98 rupees and sold it at 185 rupees. 
These are unforgivable crimes. People of this country have to wait in queues for hours to buy a can of salmon. But hundreds and thousands of salmon tins are distributed by just one signature of this chairman. These are public funds. Although salmon is given to the public at 98 rupees, the government purchases it at 200 rupees. So they have to pay the remaining money. All these concessions we receive have been misused by this chairman. When contacted, Lanka Satosa chairman Nushad Pereira admitted that the consignment of canned fish was sold to a private company for 98 rupees. However, he said there was no fraud in selling it for that price. He added that if they are sold at a higher price to another party, the relevant private company should be investigated. When some people fill their pockets with hundreds and thousands of looted money from the people, the farming community of the country continue to suffer even without having access to basic needs and wants in life. Farmers in Bongama Migalava now have to cultivate their lands without water or fertilizer. This farmland comes under the purview of the Migalava Mahavali Division Management. These farmers have cultivated more than 200 acres after working day and night. These farmlands, which are usually nourished by the Kalavava, are now scorching under the hot sun. The crops they cultivated, such as cashew and sesame seeds, were destroyed as a result of the heavy downpour. According to the farmers, one paddy land is nourished with water once in 20 days. How can they cultivate their lands with just two hours of water? Some farmers ended up in altercations with their fellow farmers without being able to share water. Let me ask you a question. How much debt does Sri Lanka have to settle? The past and present governments have continued to blame each other for the debt crisis faced by all of us as a country. The Auditor General's Department has made a startling revelation in this regard. The latest report of the Auditor General has observed that there are inconsistencies between the records of the Central Bank and the Finance Ministry on the total debt liabilities of the country. According to the report, the discrepancy stands at 700 billion rupees. According to the Ministry of Finance, the government's outstanding debt payments at the end of 2019 stood at 12.18 trillion. However, the Auditor General's report noted that this figure does not include the 700 billion rupees mentioned in central bank records. 318.2 billion rupees of the excluded amount includes loans that were raised by the issuance of treasury bonds and other foreign loans, including the loans obtained for the construction of the Hambantota port. The Auditor General has pointed out that loans worth 172 billion rupees that were obtained for the construction of the Hambantota port had not been included in the 2019 report of the finance ministry. Loans worth 82 billion rupees obtained for the second phase of the construction of the Hammantota port had also been excluded in the report of the Ministry of Finance. The Auditor General's report pointed out that loans worth 33.4 million that had been obtained in 2018 and 2019 had also not been included in the Ministry of Finance's report. The central bank is saying that the total outstanding debt of the country stands at 13.3 trillion. However, the treasury says that the total debt stands at 12.7 trillion. Why does this discrepancy exist? There are a few reasons for this. There is a difference of 320 billion because the central bank calculates only the face value of treasury bills and bonds, but the treasury calculates the amount that has been received. Therefore, there is a difference. The loans obtained from the Hambantota port has been recorded under the Sri Lanka Ports Authority and not the Treasury. Therefore, there is a problem there. If the funds belong to the Treasury, then it must be recorded in their books. This is something that began in 2013. Loans obtained by the Road Development Authority, the Urban Development Authority and the Ports Authority have not been recorded by the Treasury. The Auditor General has pointed out this previously as well. Therefore, I believe that this must be rectified. It is not good to have contrasting figures in the records of the Treasury and the Central Bank. Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa has said that the central bank must take responsibility of the economic slump of finance bodies under its purview. The Prime Minister had made these remarks during a meeting held at the Temple Trees to discuss the current situation of the Finance PLC. 
During the meeting, the Prime Minister had pointed out that the continuous breakdown of financial bodies under the central bank brings disrepute to the government. He had pointed out that the faith placed by the people on state financial bodies would diminish against such a backdrop. The Prime Minister had stressed that steps must be taken to prepare new laws or to take action against fraud at financial institutions. During the discussion, Prime Minister Rajapaksha had instructed to expedite the process of compensating depositors of the Finance PLC. Accordingly, Central Bank Deputy Governor H. Karunaratna had said that 97% of the depositors are to be compensated by Monday. He had noted that the remaining 3% of depositors would be compensated in due course. Minister Ramesh Patirana, who had attended the meeting, had said that an efficient investigation must be carried out into fraud that is taking place at financial bodies that fall under the purview of the central bank. The yellow-spotted locust, which is spreading rapidly in Kurunagala, was reported from several areas in the country today. The first sightings of the yellow-spotted locust were reported from the Francisco Vatta area in Mavatagama. Large forms of locusts have invaded cultivations in the area. The pest has also been sighted in areas such as Mavatagama, Malandenia, Udagama, Matava, Meethanvala, Barandana, Indulgodakanda, Khatupitiya, Duratiava, Nagahakanda, Katavala and Valpolakanda in the northwestern province. Today, locusts were sighted in the Udagama, Valpolakanda and Indulgodakanda areas. Hatta maapi me sambandhing gojan seva kar denuat kara. Gini sabba vinaasa karanne kila samay meheng awadun. Gojan seva kar katta kara hamke na tel. When we contacted the agrarian office, they told us that they would bring a pesticide. They also asked us to burn down the plants. It is difficult for us to do it when there are large swarms of this pest. Therefore, we request the agrarian office to implement a plan in this regard. Locusts had also been spotted in the Madurupitiya area in the Gampa district. A correspondent reported that some pests had been trapped in a bottle and have been sent to the Agriculture Research Institute in Gannorua. Agrarian officers had visited the Madurupitiya area upon information received by area residents. This pest had caused a similar damage two years ago. We had been able to control it successfully at the time. Even now, we are in a position to control it. The increase in global temperature mainly influences the increase of these locusts. If we do not control this, the pest will spread rapidly. If the southwest monsoon establishes itself properly in the country, and if we receive more rain, the numbers of locusts will reduce. The Agriculture Department has requested public to contact the hotline 1920 and to notify them if locusts are spotted in their respective areas. The importation of heifers has come to the fore once again following a decision by the government to import 2,500 heifers from Australia. In the current situation, all my property has already been auctioned after being taken over by the bank. I own nothing now. I have fallen to a situation where I now live on their land by force. The Rural Economic Ministry couldn't help us yet. They have given us only five years to pay this back. We have spoken to them many times, but they still can't seem to get us an extension. This is the situation faced by those who imported heifers in 2017. Following a cabinet paper presented last week, the government has sanctioned the importation of a further 2,500 heifers. The program this year will not see the heifers be distributed directly among the farmers, but will instead see the cows bred in a suitable area. We have problems regarding why they are importing 2,500 heifers to make them reproduce. I don't think we need 2,500 heifers to do this. Moreover, we will only see the results of this in two years. There is something underhand here because every time the directress says there is no issue and that the issue pops up as they had not been fed properly. Then even the ministers and the MPs, even they like to pass the ball saying this has happened in 2012 and some other year blaming this government and the next. By just by importing 2,500 heifers, hmm. will it help? No, because couple, about two years back, if my memory serves me right, hmm? 2,500 heifers were imported. And what happened? During the presidency of Mahindra Rajapaksa? No, no, no. Sorry, during the Yahapalne government? Yes. yes. So what happened? How many are living? See, this is, we have been always depending on, especially on agriculture and other technical 
on on other technical subjects mm -hmm. that we have been depending on the foreign elements whereas we have the know how we have the technology and we have the resources we have to harness what we have mm -hmm. we have to upgrade the knowledge that we have and the the other if you for the for a, for an example now you are talking about heifers okay livestock for that matter so find what is wrong with our heifers cows and if the milk yield is low how can we improve it hmm. i don't see any i don't see the light by importing 2000 heifers who has given this stupid idea all the animals that we bought before 2014 were bought to the National Livestock Development and then only they were released to the people. However, in 2017, the animals were bought and directly given to the farmers for the purpose of establishing a commercial dairy industry. That project was a failure. We did not prepare the grass to feed the heifers. The grass should be prepared for the bull because we can't find a fast route. In the year 2017, 2,500 heifers were imported. Out of that, 250 were received from the Vaunia district. Sadly, most of those cows are sick and dead. There are only 25 farmers left in the Vaunia district. We object to the importation of such cows, knowing the mistake that took place in the past. On to the COVID-19 update of the day, 13 new cases were reported a short while ago and according to the Director General of Government Information, all 13 are from the Sri Lanka Navy. This brings the total number of COVID-19 patients in the country to 1,730. 883 patients are currently under medical treatment. 11 deaths have been reported. And on a positive note, 836 people have fully recovered from the virus in Sri Lanka. The unveiling of a statue of Lord Buddha at Musius College was held this morning. The statue was unveiled amidst the chanting of spirit by Hunupitiya Ganga Rama Vihari Adhikari, Venerable Dr. Kirinde Asajitera. The statue of Lord Buddha was unveiled by Deshamanya Ajita D. Soisa, the chairman of the board of trustees of the school. The event was attended by the principal of Musius College, Nelum Senadira, the staff and a group of students. The construction activities of a new intensive care unit at the Nigambo General Hospital concluded last week. The project was completed by Dialogue Asiata as the first step of a pledge of 200 million rupees towards developing ICUs in hospitals selected by the Ministry of Health and Indigenous Medical Services. This 200 million project was in particular to help the health sector. We identified the need to improve the critical care ICU infra capacity in the country to support the COVID pandemic as well as the requirements going beyond COVID. Um, going forward, what we believe is that uh, we will uh, be starting phase two of this project, uh, which will be uh, developing the ICU at the Homagam Hospital. And it's a um, case in point to all such public-private partnership projects that we can, what we can achieve as a country uh, when all forces come together uh, for a larger purpose. We leave you tonight with the students of eight schools presenting their rendition of the Nagitimu Sri Lanka song. For the news first team, I'm Chaturanga Kuarachi with our sign language interpreter by Brian D. Cruz. Have a safe day and good night. Pada
Mad Dog, Nagitimo, Sri Lanka.